Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to MOS Live for our virtual planetarium, The Sky Tonight. We're super, super excited to have you all here today. My name is Karen. I'm one of the many educators at the Museum of Science, and today I will be acting as your moderator. All this means is that I'm going to be keeping an eye out for any of your comments, your observations, your questions, and I'll be passing them on to our planetarium educator, Talia, who will meet momentarily. So here on Zoom, if you do have an observation or a comment you would like to share, you can use the Q&A box and just type it right on in there and it'll come right to me and I'll be able to pass it along. If you are watching on Facebook Live or YouTube Live, we so appreciate that you're tuning in today, but unfortunately we cannot fill the questions and comments from there. And lastly, if you do need closed captioning, you can click the CC button and choose show subtitles. So with that, I'm going to have Talia come on and introduce herself. As soon as I get my video to work. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Karen said, my name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns. And I, uh, in normal times, am found under the dome at the Charles Hayden Planetarium. But today I'm going to be talking to you about some things that you'll be able to see up in the sky. Maybe not tonight as I'm looking out the window. It looks kind of cloudy, but whatever the next clear night will be. And to do that, I'm going to uh, use a program called Stellarium. And this is uh, a free open source program that you can download. Um, it's available on the internet. It's great for uh, looking at the night sky or trying to see what's going to be up in the sky uh, from anywhere or at any time on earth. It's pretty powerful. And I have it set for tonight at eight o'clock for Boston, Massachusetts. And we are looking, as you can guess, towards the south. So we're looking at the southern part of the southern horizon. And that's because um, if you have been tuning in for the last couple of uh, weeks on this particular um, program, we're going to be covering very similar ground because there's just, this is the time of year where you talk about the southern sky. The southern winter sky from here in New Zealand has some of the best constellations, or from here in New Zealand? <laughs> Did I just say New Zealand? You say New Zealand. I thought you meant New England. I meant New England. I said New Zealand. It's Friday afternoon, folks. I am sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see uh, the same things uh, in New Zealand as you can from New England. That's a program for another day. The southern, the southern hemisphere sky. Okay, cool. We're off to a roaring start. Um, so the southern sky, the way you can see it from New England in the winter time, especially right now in January. Uh, are some of the easiest to spot constellations and some of the more familiar ones. So we just, we love talking about it. It's our favorite piece of night sky. To ask any uh, person who works in a planetarium, this is probably their favorite bit of sky to talk about. I know it's Karen's. Yes, I love it. I'm so excited. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started looking at what's up in that Southern sky. Uh, so here we have it. First off, we have the moon. You uh, probably don't need my help finding the moon. We are just past um, the first quarter moon. We had the first quarter moon, I believe it was on the 20th, um, which means the moon was one quarter of the way through its orbit around the earth, uh, which it completes an orbit about once a month. And uh, it's going to be full on the 28th. January 28th will be the full wolf moon. So you can spot, it. the moon is also in the southern sky tonight uh, and lighting it up. Also in the southern sky right now, high in the southern sky, is this um, bright red object. You'll notice all of these other bright stars, some of which are rather reddish. Um, they all have names attached to them here and this one doesn't. And the reason for that is because that is not a star. Now, if you were gonna go ahead and take a guess as to what that was, Go ahead and put that guess in the Q&A. If you've got no idea what it is, feel free to just put some question marks or an I don't know. One of the most important things in science is to know when you don't know something and to be able to admit it. So if you don't know what it is, feel free to put I don't know. If you do have a guess as to what this object, this reddish object over here would be, go ahead and put that in the Q&A. So we got uh, some people guessing a planet or planet question mark. Um, somebody asking, is it the Big Dipper? Someone specifying that maybe it's Saturn or maybe 
Mars, Nora, who is 10, and Roslyn, seven, think it might be Mars. Planet, question mark, Mars, Mars, a planet, Mars. ISS, ooh, I like that one. Um, Pluto, that's another good guess. But for the most part, I think most friends think that it is a planet, um, but maybe are unsure what planet it is. Well, you guys are, are correct, that is a planet. Um, and it's the only really good planet we have for viewing in the evening sky right now. Um, I know in December, everybody was very excited about Saturn and Jupiter. They're really setting with the sun right now. They're not really great for viewing. This particular planet is nice and high in the sky um, and good for viewing for most of the evening. And uh, that the dead giveaway as to which planet this is, is that reddish color. So there is one planet that we call the red planet and that is Mars. And the reason we call it the red planet is because it's, it's red. It's uh, covered in rust, actually, um, uh, rusted iron. And uh, that gives it a distinctive red color and it does look reddish in the sky. So the traditional, uh, the official name for it is Mars. Mars was a god of war. If you look back at cultures throughout history, they've named it for war, for blood, for fire, for things that are associated with red because it does have that distinctive color. And I'm very excited about Mars right now just because we do have several spacecraft on their way to Mars. They've been traveling for months since the summer. They're gonna arrive in February, three different spacecraft. Um, one from China, China's first Martian craft, one from the United Arab Emirates, the first Arab Martian spacecraft, and one from the United States, NASA's next rover, Perseverance, which will be arriving on the red planet on February 18th, so less than a month. So I get very excited about Mars in the sky because it reminds me that Perseverance is almost there. So you have the moon and you have Mars, and those are not stars, but everything else you can see over here is, uh, and there may be a constellation or maybe part of a constellation here in the sky, the way we can see it right now that you might recognize. Uh, so if you do see something that you recognize, go ahead and put that in the Q&A. And if you don't, that's perfectly fine. You can go ahead and put those question marks. Oh, we're already getting votes in. Um, I have a vote thus far for Orion's belt, Orion, people admitting they're unsure with question marks. Ryan's belt, Ryan's belt, Ryan's belt. Uh, more question marks. It looks like an umbrella. I love when people use their imagination and make up your own constellations, whether or not they are the official ones. So excellent job. Um, but yes, most people think it's Orion or related to Orion's belt. Yeah, all constellations are made up. So if you just make up your That's own, true. you're doing the same thing. So yes, what we're looking at here in the sort of the south, southeast sky, you will can see these three stars right in a row. And they are Orion's belt. Let's zoom out a little so we don't see the names as much. So those are the three stars of Orion's belt. Nowhere else in the sky do you see three stars lined up quite so nicely in a straight line. They're nice and equally spaced apart and the three stars are very similar in brightness. So it looks like three uh, pretty identical stars almost perfectly evenly spaced in an almost perfectly straight line. Of course, that is space playing a trick on you. Um, <laughs> these three stars are not, they're very different distances away from Earth. They are actually different brightnesses. The one in the middle is actually much farther away from Earth than the two on the ends. So um, Alnilam here is farther away from Earth than Alnataka Mantaka. You don't need to know the names, it's fine. Um, and- There will be a quiz later? Come on, Talia. No. So actually Alnilam here is a brighter star as well. It's just also farther away. They just happen to line up like this. And it's really great because you can use the belt as sort of your anchor for looking at the winter sky. Now that is just Orion's belt. There is more to him than his waist. If you go up from the belt on this side, there's a shoulder. Over here on the other side is his other shoulder, the bright red star, Betelgeuse. Uh, in between his shoulders here is his little tiny head. Down from the belt on this side is a knee. Down from the belt on the other side is his other knee. And Orion was a hunter. So um, in mythology, in Greek mythology, and like most hunters, he has weapons. So it's very faint and hard to see. You can sort of see it a little better if I zoom in. There is an arm holding a sword coming up off of this shoulder. In the other 
hand is this curve of stars, which is sometimes depicted as a shield. Sometimes it's depicted as a bow, but he's definitely holding something, a shield or a bow or something in his other hand, which is represented by this curve of stars. And he has a scabbard for his sword hanging down below his belt because you gotta have somewhere to put it when you're not using it. So that is the constellation Orion. I'll go ahead and put the, uh, the lines for that constellation up there. And what do you think? Do you, if you were seeing this for the first time, would you think that this looks like a hunter in the sky? Just, you know, a yes or a no, or I, maybe? For me, I think it looks like an hourglass. Mm, I do definitely see an hourglass if there. You, if you sort of discount the club above his head and the shield bow out front. Mm. Um, other folks are question mark, uh, People votes very emphatically for no with lots of uh, exclamation points. It does not look like a hunter. Um, let's see. Sure. I'd like more of his legs to really complete the picture. I like, I like the well thought out answer there. Kind of, definitely not. Well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that um, I agree that this doesn't necessarily look like a hunter. Uh, the bad news is that Orion is one of the constellations that looks most like what it is supposed to be. So we're going to have some interesting uh, shapes. Someone says they like that he's wearing a kilt. Sorry, I just had to get that one in there because I appreciate that comment. Um, so, you know, whether or not you do think Orion looks like a hunter, I think it's a little eh. Um, this is one of the ones that looks most like what it's supposed to be. So... Some of these other for a fun ride. Fun. We are in for a fun ride. Now, Orion's belt is a very handy pointer. Once you have found it in the sky, like I said, you can sort of use it as your anchor to find other things in the night sky. It's a very good pointer. So if you follow the direction that it points up to here, this sort of other bright red star, we've got two sort of bright reddish colored stars in the sky near each other. I like Eldebaran. I always think it sounds like Alderaan from Star Wars, um, but it's not. Eldebaran is, um, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put, not the line, I'm just the line. I'm also gonna put the picture up there just so you can see what Orion is supposed to look like. I sort of skipped over that part. Um, so there he is and he's got his, uh, his weapon raised because he is in the middle of a fight and uh, you can use the belt to find his opponent. It will point you to this bright red star Aldebaran and to this sort of V-shape, which I can zoom in on right here, this V-shape in the sky, which um, tonight is very close to the moon. The moon is going to be moving along in its orbit, so it's not going to stay very close to this V-shape. But you can definitely see that V-shape in the sky. That is the face and head of Orion's opponent. Aldebaran, that reddish star, marks one very angry eye of Orion's opponent. And I should say that half of Orion's opponent is in the sky, only half. Um, so what there is of a body comes down in this direction and then out in this direction. So it's sort of right here. And then coming up off the top of the head are two big long horns. Now who or what do you think Orion might be in the middle of a fight with uh, that has two big long horns on the top of its head? While we're waiting, I'll just note, the Greeks really liked putting half animal constellations in the sky. Pegasus just, is another one that's a half. Yeah, they did it a couple of times. <laughs> uh, so it sounds like folks know what we're looking at. We got Taurus, Bull, the Red Bull, um, probably, I guess, based off of that angry red eye. Ooh. Um, is that a last unicorn reference? Because that's my new favorite audience member. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I haven't heard of the last unicorn. Uh, but maybe our friend will mention if that's what your reference was. <laughs> um, that's a staple of my childhood, the slightly terrifying cartoon, The Last Unicorn, in which a very angry red bull is a feature. But yes, this is a bull, or the front half of one anyway. It's Taurus the bull. It's supposed to be his front half. Um, I don't know. Do you guys think this looks like the front half of an angry bull? What would oh. you call this? I would not go with front half of an angry bull, personally. Uh, I don't even know what I'd call it based on those lines. Yeah. Nora and Rosalind say, no, it doesn't look like a bull. I sort of see it. The head is really small. And, and I feel like once we've heard what it is, we can 
imagine it a little bit better, but it's the people that imagined it right off the bat. I um, personally four-legged well, spider. That's kind of what I, I thought. Was about to say a four-legged spider, but it's interesting that you th- mentioned the people who um, saw this right off the bat. This is one of the constellations we think is very, 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 very old. So um, many different cultures from around the world have their own. I like uh, this one. It looks like a long telescope. That's a that's a nice one. They have their own sets of constellations, um, and in most of them, there, there might be similarities, but what they saw in the sky was very different. There are a few constellations out there where what people thought they were was very similar across many different cultures over many different time periods, and the idea is that that happened because the that constellation was very, very old. And we actually know that Taurus is a very, very old constellation. There is actually a cave painting of this set of stars marking the face and the horns um, with a bull painted on top of it. So we know that this the idea of this group of stars being a bull is quite old. I still, again, don't know how they got there at the beginning, but uh, there he is. Now I thought it looked like an X-Wing. I knew you'd appreciate that one. Oh, I like the X-Wing. Yeah, yeah. now that's all I'm ever going to be able to see. <laughs> Taurus the X-Wing. Taurus the X-Wing. So there he is, the very angry bull who is charging at Orion. Um, and I don't know what Orion did to irritate the bull. Personally, I try to avoid irritating animals with huge horns on the top of their heads. But he has clearly done something because the bull is charging at him and Orion has his weapon raised. He's ready to defend himself. And these two are locked in combat in the southern sky. They take up a pretty huge chunk of the southern sky and they are really the heart of the winter sky. Um, So the very first bits of Taurus are to rise are sort of what my indication when I'm looking at the night sky in the fall that the winter sky is preparing to rise. Uh, And Orion is what I call the king of the winter sky. He's the center of the winter sky, the most prominent uh, of the winter constellations. And Orion may may not be doing okay in this fight against the bull because uh, there's a wound in the shoulder of the bull. You might notice this little group of stars right here. Um, One of the struts of the (laughs) X-wing. This is sometimes uh, interpreted as being a wound in the bull's shoulder. Uh, It is, however, what it is, is a star cluster and it has its own name. And the great thing is it's pretty easy to find in the night sky, even when it's not near the moon. First of all, your eye tends to be drawn to it anyway because it is a little cluster and stars don't usually cluster like that. The eye is sort of drawn to it. It kind of looks like a little, 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 little dipper. But if you are having trouble finding it, Orion's belt does point to it. So if you follow the belt through the curve of his shield, through Taurus's face, it does point you to this little group of stars, which uh, has the name the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. And this is an interesting, another interesting, very old concept, we think, because cultures as far apart as um, Aboriginal Australians and Northern Europeans saw this as seven female figures. The Greek name Pleiades means the seven sisters. But so we think this is another a uh, very, very old idea, especially since you might be looking at it saying, wait, I don't see seven stars there. That's because you really can't see seven. You can really only see six. But again, cultures from all over the world interpret this as seven female figures. And if you go back far enough, two of the stars in this cluster were a little bit farther apart and were a- able to be depicted seen as two stars. So we think once again, the seven sisters is a very, very old concept. And as I zoom in, you'll be able to see there's more than seven stars there. This cluster actually contains hundreds of stars. If you look at it with binoculars or a telescope, you can see a lot more of those stars. Um, And what this is, is a bunch of very young stars, young meaning less than a million years old, Um, and they are still surrounded by the wisps of the nebula that they were born from. And they're all siblings. They were all born from the same nebula. And our sun would have once belonged to a cluster like this. 
um, when it was first born. It would have been surrounded by other stars that had been born out of the same nebula, its siblings. Um, over the last, you know, five billion years, all the stars from that cluster have drifted apart. We think we might have found one or two of the sun's siblings. As for the rest, you know, they don't call, they don't write, they don't come home for holidays. They seem to get those uh, ancestry DNA, right? Go. Isn't that how you find your long lost siblings? Uh, well, in terms of how you find it with stars, what you actually look for are stars that have very similar um, makeups to the sun. So, you know, most stars have very basically similar, but in terms of very fine amounts of what elements they have inside of them, stars with very, very, very similar amounts probably came from the same nebula because the nebula would have just had those elements in that amount. So that's what you can find if you follow Orion's belt up. You can find the face of Taurus the bull, you can find the Pleiades, and you can find other things if you follow it down because Orion was dumb enough to pick a fight with an angry bull. He was not dumb enough to do it on his own. And if you follow his belt down, it points to this extremely bright star, which has a name you might recognize, Sirius. That may be a name you recognize from the Harry Potter novels, which in which the character of Sirius Black can turn into a dog. And it is not a coincidence that the character named Sirius can turn into a dog. He's named after this star, which is called the dog star, Sirius the dog star, because it's the brightest star in a constellation called Canis Major, which means big dog. And maybe I could sort of see a dog there. It's kind of standing upright, maybe. I don't know. What would you call this constellation if you were in charge of giving it a name? You know what it looks like to me? What? It looks like a headless horseman dancing and holding his head. <laughs> all right. All right. We're getting creative. That's good. You need to get creative when you're designing constellations. Uh, it looks like a fox or a dancing man. See, somebody else thought it was a dancing person. I just right. called them the headless horseman. Uh, it looks like a triangle dog. Um, I could see it if Sirius is the dog shoulder. Mm. As opposed to like its neck. Like yeah. See it, I see it as a dog. Uh, I see it when I turn my head to the left. Ooh, that's an interesting um, sort of sky gazing trick also. So Ooh. very faint objects. If you look a little to the left or the right, can usually see it better. Cartoon dog. I think mean Maybe a cartoon dog. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very interesting looking dog. Um, there he is, Sirius, <laughs> Orion's loyal hunting dog. Hounds of the underworld in that artistic rendition. Uh, he's trailing behind his master in the battle against the bull. And again, you can find that by using um, the belt. The belt will point you to it. Now, Sirius is not the only Harry Potter connection in this patch of sky. You may have noticed when I clicked on this star earlier, Orion's shoulder, it's named Bellatrix, which is another character from Harry Potter. You, of course, probably have heard of a character named Beetlejuice. Got to go back a little farther in time to get to that movie character. Uh, Orion, interestingly, has had bo both of his shoulder stars have had movie characters named after it, which is an odd distinction. Um, and to find Orion's second companion, we're not going to use his belt. We're going to use Beetlejuice, which roughly translated means armpit of the great one. Which, you know, it's <laughs> about where it's armpit. It's armpit. He uses armpit. And he's a great one. You can make a triangle out of Beetlejuice, Sirius, and this bright star over here, which just has the really awesome sci-fi sounding name of Procyon. So Beetlejuice, Sirius, and Procyon make an almost perfect triangle over here in the southeast sky. And Procyon is the brightest star in Orion's second companion. And I think this time... I'm just gonna put the stick figure up there and have you guys tell me what you think it's supposed to be without telling you beforehand. So there's the stick figure. Go. You're not seeing it wrong. There are only two stars in this constellation. What do you think that is? It's a fish to be? stick. A serious a line. Somebody suggests a baton. 
So I'll give you a hint. A you ladder. You may have heard. A uh, phone for the dog. Sorry, they were taking a little while to come in. S a small one is a stick. Stick so, for serious defect. See, someone agreed with my assessment. So you may have remember if you've ever seen or heard of um, some of these northern constellations, there's Ursa Major, the Great Bear. There's also Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. And here we have Canis Major, the Great Dog. If you have a great dog, if you have a Canis Major, you need to have a Canis Minor, the Little Dog. And that's what we're looking at here. The only dog I see there is a hot dog, but this is in fact meant to be Orion's Loyal Hunting Puppy. So there they are, Orion and his loyal hunting dogs, um, as you can see, taking up a huge chunk of the southern sky. Right now, this is where they are at 8 p.m. Um, they will be moving at 8. If you keep looking for, at them for them at 8 p.m., you'll see them over the course of the next like month and a half progressing their way uh, towards the western half of the sky. But this is the middle of winter. This is the time for these constellations to reign over the southern sky. You don't have to go out and look for them right now. Like I said, they're going to be visible for like the next month and a half really easily. So go ahead, the next clear night, head out, look for Orion and his belt, use the belt to find the bull, use the belt to find the dog, use Beetlejuice and Sirius to find uh, the two stars of Candace Minor, the little dog, and see this epic battle play out for yourself. Now, I know I talked a lot and we don't have that much time, but I would love to answer some questions, Karen, if any came in. There have been two that I've been hanging on to here in our Q&A. Um, when we were looking at specifically Beetlejuice, Aldebaran, and of course Mars, someone asked the question of why are the stars red? That is a great question. So stars, when they uh, are red because they are cooler. So a star's um, color is determined by its temperature. And we can sort of zoom in again. Orion makes a great example because you've got, say, Rigel, his knee star, which is a nice bright blue. Bellatrix is also a bright blue star. Betelgeuse is a red star because it's cooler. These blue stars are blazing hot, like 25,000 degrees on their surface. Betelgeuse is going to be cooler, more like 4,000 degrees. The sun is a yellow star. It's more like seven, 6,000 degrees on its surface. And there are two reasons why a star is sort of that color, why it's that temperature. Either it just formed that way. Small stars are very dim. They tend to be very cool and they tend to be very red. We can't really see those stars. They're so dim that we can't see them with our eyes. When we can see red stars like this, that means they're big stars that are approaching the ends of their lives. They're running out of fuel. And when they do that, they swell up. And when they swell up, their outer layers cool off. So Betelgeuse is a star that is a really massive star that's going to go supernova pretty soon, like in the next million years or so. So, you know, soon on an astronomical time scale. Aldebaran is a more, is a smaller star. It's more like the sun. Um, it is also, it's closer to the sun in size. It is, however, also cooling off and swelling up and its outer layers are um, turning red. So that is why Betelgeuse and Aldebaran have a reddish color. And that's why if you see, can see stars with the reddish color in the sky, it usually means they are stars that are running out of fuel. All right, I know we are like, just at the end of our time, but we had one other question. Um, when we were looking at the Pleiades, someone asked, can you ever see a star being born? Not really, because when they're born, you can actually see a star forming region in Orion's um, scabbard right here. It looks like this big cloud. This is the closest star forming region um, to Earth. This is the Orion Nebula. And you can see the stars in it look really tiny and stars don't form immediately. Um, they form over the course of like 100,000 years. So they form pretty slowly. What we can do is we can look at nebulas like Orion with big telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope and look at stars that are in different stages of formation. And from that, we can figure out what the whole formation process looks like just by looking at the different stages of it, um, by looking at different stars. But unfortunately, we can't just watch a star being born. Awesome. Well, this was a lot of fun, Talia. So I want to thank you for kind of taking us on a tour of the Southern sky. As you said at the beginning, it is one of my favorite parts, not only to look at and learn about, but also to teach about. 
Um, I do miss uh, teaching in the planetarium with all the stars. So hopefully someday soon we'll get back in there and maybe some of these friends here will visit us at the museum. Hopefully everybody can give Talia like a nice silent cheer for taking us on our journey. I also want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, hopefully you had some fun, you learned a few new things. Um, if you want to know sort of what we're doing for these live streams, you can check out MOS at Home on our website. Uh, if you enjoyed this presentation and are able to do so, we would love for you to consider making a donation so we can keep doing programs like this for all of you. Um, and if you were curious what program Talia was using, it's called Stellarium. It is a free open source uh, product, so you can just find it online and download it and kind of play around and you can go far back in time to see what the sky looks like. You can fast forward in time to see what the sky will look like next week, next month, 100 years from now. So it's kind of a fun product to, to play around with. But again, I want to thank you guys for coming out. I hope you had some fun and definitely enjoy the rest of your Friday.